have, uh, of course, uh, Aaron Cooter, Tom Gromit, and uh, John ba uh, uh, Bogdanov. I got it, right? Oh, yeah. First try. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, they're going to, of course, talk about their different experiences uh, with Superman, and uh, you, of course, will be able to ask uh, your questions uh, of, the cr of the creators there. Um, so, kind of kick it off, I guess. Um, kinda, it's a kind of a big mantle taking on that icon. What's, what's the mindset? What does he, what the mindset you bring into him? What does he mean to you? Because um, Superman can be so many things on so many different levels. So when you're tackling it, what was your first impression of it? Fear. <laughs> I mean, it, it being, yeah, short answer, fear. Yeah. <laughs> Intimidation, uh, flop sweat, uh, being, being asked to uh, come on up on stage and jam with Springsteen. That kind of thing. It is daunting. I, I knew when I got into comic books, I knew that, that Superman was ultimately what I wanted to do. It was my dream job. But um, Mike Carlin pursued me for f fully a year uh, to come and join the Superman books, and I kept resisting it just because I was scared of yeah. sucking. Yeah. My... my uh, my first San Diego, I met uh, Mike Carlin for the first time. He was my Titans editor mm -hmm. as well. Actually, his assistant was doing most of the work, but Mike had inherited the book. So at my very, very first dinner with Mike, I, I said to him, what do I have to do to do a Superman story? I just want to do one, and I, I will die happy. And uh, I don't care if it's a backup, a fill-in, uh, an annual, whatever. He said, well, I'll keep you in mind. And from that, I got uh, an annual, an Action Comics annual, and an Action Comics fill-in after that, and worked with Roger Stern on that. And then when uh, Jerry Ordway decided to uh, uh, lighten his workload to just simply writing adventures of Superman, I got those penciling duties. So in a way, I actively campaigned for the job, but I almost instantly regretted it the first time I got that script. I was so intimidated. And uh, like you, feared sucking. Did you, <clears throat> is that because, um you felt a, a custodianship, a, a stewardship responsibility uh, to this cultural icon, or, or it was mostly that. Yeah. It was mostly that. Follow, I mean, following Jerry Orway is enough of a fear. Well, following it, Jerry, yeah. <laughs> following absolutely everybody who came before, we do stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jose Delbo has joined us as well. <laughs> Jose, the topic is the. Uh, Talk slowly because I gotta hear you from. Absolutely, <laughs> Jose. Um, the topic right now is uh, your first feelings when first asked to uh, do Superman. Kind of that responsibility. Well, well, in those days, I was mostly doing Wonder Woman, and uh, I remember that uh, suddenly one of the guys, one of the cartoons who were doing the, the Daily Strip stop doing it and Joe Orlando called me from DC Comics and he asked me if I would like to do the strip. Uh, of course, you know, you don't have the chance to do Superman too often and was on the strip. I took it, you know, and uh, it was an easy job because it was only three panels per, per strip. Now, my problem was not my problem, the writer has a problem. One day he came to me and says, Jose, I don't know what to do with Superman. The guy, you know, we did everything. Nothing can kill him. Crypt kryptonite, yellow, blue, purple, <laughs> and 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 he has X-ray vision. I never looked to the panties of a girl. You know, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know what to do with this guy. He says, "Okay, keep it this way. Make it easy. Don't complicate my life." You know, and and then I got a lot of fun in there because I had to do that guy with a. Name, you can pronounce his name the right way, have to do the other way, cheap, cheap, cheap. Oh, no, mix his <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, another guy was a gaucho, you know, that was fine because, you know, I'm from Argentina where the gauchos come from. And then I like to do horses. And that time, you know, the gaucho wasn't horses, but that was also a lot of fun with it to do. 
in January, I didn't have too much trouble, you know, and uh, also I have to, you know, I'm getting older, I'm, um, I forget a lot of things. I did so many pictures in my life that I, re I don't remember, you know, uh, I think the name was Brainiac, right? Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 one, I don't know, I think in a couple of weeks, Brainiac was a, the bad guy, you know, and then I have to do that. It was a lot of fun because they gave me the opportunity to to, 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 to try different characters, different situations, and, uh, and you know, uh, what else can I say, you know, have a lot of fun to do it, you know. I feel sorry when, when they stopped printing it out. I realized that in those days, in Adventure Panel, in a newspaper, mm, you know, it's very hard, nobody has time to follow, you know, like in the old time, the yeah. Florencio La Guardia, you know, yeah. to follow for the story in the newspaper every day. It's just boom, boom, boom. The people get up today and go to the computer, right? And yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And <laughs> and that's the end of the adventure strip, you know. I also ghost the Phantom, and, and the Phantom also is doing the like this, you know. But do, when I had the chance to do it, I have a lot of fun, you know. And you notice my Boston accent, you know. <laughs> 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 what else? Oh. Yeah, no. Um, that's that's one of the, one of the great things about Superman in particular is that his his gallery of villains, his his char the characters that come along with him, are they're just completely out there. I mean, you, you, it's not just super super villains in suits. It's you know giant heads on tiny bodies, and you get to draw like just the the weirdest stuff. Uh, yeah, it's it's very fun. Yeah. I think with. Uh, you Man. go far away, very high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, uh, but, no, but, like, you know, I was just thinking, like, you know, with, like, the, the, as, as the newest guy in this panel for, for Superman, you know, I'm, I was completely overwhelmed, and, and, and I think it was in the second month of drawing action that uh, I was finally feeling like, okay, I've got my, Got my rhythm. I can I can draw them and not sweat. By the second month. By the second month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a fast learner. <laughs> I'll say. Uh, I'm I'm just starting to get them down now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a fo it was a false start. <laughs> but I tweeted something about like finally finally figuring out how I like to draw Superman's face, and then Jim Lee tweets back at me like, Yeah, in 76 years you're gonna get it in the two second month or something like that. Yeah. So, there's, there's plenty of people to, to remind you of where you're coming from with this character. And mm -hmm. it, it, so much respect. Yeah. So we do have our first question from the audience, and I'm making my way over to him right now. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> I've been a comic book collector for many, many years. I started in 1968 when I bought my first comic book. I was eight years old. And I still remember it. It was a... Uh, uh, a Captain America Iron Man nice. you know uh, book and I still have it nice. uh, but Superman was and still is my favorite character of all time and I can still remember with my buddy Mario who lived across the street from me was still buddies and we go to buy our comics every week we go in those days they weren't comic shops right they had just newsstands you know stuff like that that's where you got your comics and we go every week to buy our comics, and Superman was always the one that I had to get. Yeah. I went to, the, to buy back issues when comic shops started coming in, and I bought all these back issues. And in those days, they didn't care. They put 25 cents in black marker on the cover, yeah. right? They didn't care about you know, the, how the cover looked. And no one did. We just wanted the book, right? So I have a vast collection of comic books. But now to my point of the question. I am very, this is just me. I'm saddened by where Superman is today. I mean, I don't even buy the comic anymore. Um, I'm a, my favorite artist of all time for Superman, and I love all you guys, but my favorite is Kurt Swan. Yeah. He, his Superman to me was the best. And I, and I like those stories. I like the old paper and six panels per page, you know, and all that stuff. I like all that. I like the imaginary tales, you know, the classic covers that they had. So I love all that stuff. For sure. 
but to, I just the way I, I just I just can't get over what Superman is today. You know, is Lois and Clark, and he's this and that, and and I, I'm just saddened by what's happened to Superman. And I don't think sales are that great for Superman today because I follow the you know yeah. bleeding cool you know website, and I yeah, look at that. Just, just, just. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so from the to the panel, and, and by the way, the death of Superman was tremendous. I was on the ground floor when that came out, and I remember buying all the comics and the uh, hysteria. If you guys remember, even on Wall Street, they were going crazy about that first comic yeah. book, right? Remember that night? Yeah. And I'm a New Yorker. I live in Florida now, but I, at the time, I was living in New York, and I remember. You're still a New Yorker. Of course, <laughs> you're, you're never. I've met more yeah. New Yorkers in Florida than I. Have. Oh, it's anyway. true. true. Yeah. Well, you, once you're, in, I'm 44 years. I lived in New York, so in Queens. My mom still lives in Jamaica, but um, uh, but um, so your opinion. What do you see? You know, how do you like the way the direction of Superman has gone in? And and if you had to do, if you if it was up to you, would you do something different? Um, I'll jump into this dangerous subject right away. Uh, <laughs> I won't be throwing punches anymore. Anyway. You do realize by, they want to work by, still, right? Uh, by saying that, um, uh, you know, I I take some comfort in the fact that uh, if I if I don't like a story or a storyline that's coming along, it doesn't mean that all those comics I love no longer exist. They, are, you know, uh, I uh, <clears throat> I've come to understand that characters can die in comics and, and come back and that and that nothing is permanent so if you if you don't like what's happening at any given time uh, um, a it doesn't invalidate the stuff you do love and it also doesn't mean that that things aren't going to get better uh, in the future um, but I in light of the things that you love, one of the things that, that uh, Aaron told me a story last night that when he got a job drawing, we were talking about stewardship and how we uh, do have reverence for the character and the history of the character. And when he got the job to draw T-shirt Superman, um, uh, he <laughs> this went- before we came up with the T-shirt idea. Uh, but yeah. Okay, he went out and he, um, he bought long boxes full of old comics from before he ever read. Yeah. So, um, so he has a, his in version of Superman has a firm grounding in all the stuff that you love. Um, uh, and I, th I think that's um, to some degree, and I don't know if this is true for you, but for, for my generation and pretty much anyone who came after Kurt Swan, I think uh, we all uh, feel the weight of history. As Tom said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And we feel the weight of history, and there are things we like in the past, and there are things we hate in the past, but, uh, but we're all, all pretty passionate about it and, and um, conscious of trying to preserve and foster what's good and lasting and intrinsic about the character. Yeah, I think... I think so I, in, in many ways, I think this question is maybe not just to me, but like aimed at me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so with, with T-Shirt Superman, the, the, the original concept behind it was that we, we, we had inherited this Superman that we, like Greg and I um, didn't feel it was the, the, the Superman that people wanted to read. And we, we tried to figure out ways to, we, we, talked, we would talk for hours about what is the concept of Superman and what is it that people want from Superman and who is Superman. And those answers are obvious. He's, he's not a hard character to figure out. He's, he's for truth, he's for defending the little guy, he's for standing up for when things go wrong and, and no matter what, saving the day. And that's like the under underlining premise for the character, character description or whatever, every time. And so with depowering him, with taking away everything that we could take away from him, it, it has him as a character answer that question of, 
does he stand up for the same things he stood up for before? And of course, that's a no brainer. Of course he does. But it's the journey that we were trying to show and, and are still trying to show. It's, the storyline's not done. But, um, <coughs> and in that, that was, uh, that's really our homage to a lot of the, the stuff that came before us, before the new 52 in particular, of saying, like that's why we have the Fleischer t-shirt, the, um, to say, you know, here's the character that could jump tall buildings and could, but couldn't fly. And um, it's a delicate balance, especially the thing about any of these comic book characters is that you don't own them. You know, you, you, you're being given a character to work on. And we come up with ideas to try to, try, try to get by DC or have DC let us make. And it's, it's, a, it's a roll in the dice. All we do is, is uh, bear the torch. We carry the torch forward. That's really the way I've always looked at it. Is it yeah. the torch ends up in my hand, you know, for, for whatever reason, and it's my job to carry that torch and then hand it off to the next guy. Right. And what they end up, when, what they end up doing with it, I have no, no control over. I have no say, and I, I have very, almost very little say in, in what occurs while I'm bearing that torch. And also, it's a, it's a lot harder now to present something new and something different and something ex uh, like, you know, exciting without everybody knowing what it is before it even reaches the stands. Exactly. I mean, when the T-shirt when the, when the design came out, we were, we were so excited about it. Um, because we didn't know Wonder Woman was getting a new outfit and Aquaman was getting a new outfit. We thought it was just Superman. And we were like, all right, you know, Super, Superman's gonna change for a little bit. And it was a specific contained story. And it turned into this big, like, company-wide, like everybody's getting new outfits and Wonder Woman has blades. And, and, and I just I shook my head. I was like, ah, what can you do? Uh, well, uh, uh, he mentioned about you had Superman change. Not only Superman, all the comic books change. Right. All the characters, you know. I did Wonder Woman for seven years, you know. Every time I, I try to go a little, a little, you know, they call me on the in DC office and says, Jose, you are doing the boobs too big. Go down. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and, and another thing, you know, today, I don't like Wonder Woman today. They make it look like a hooker, you know. I, 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 I don't like the way Wonder Woman lies today, you know. But I remember when I was doing that, you know, Jeanette uh, Han used to call me at her office and says, calm down, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what's my, my conscience, but I remember in those days, the office were very tough with doing changes in the characters, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. You have to keep it straight, especially with the, with the book that Garcia Lopez did, you have to follow that. And uh, and um, and don't try to be innovative, especially when you get an editor like Julius Schwartz, who will say to you, "No, don't go, ahead, don't do that, don't don't change it." Do it. But like you say, it's true. All the characters change a lot. Yeah. Actually, all the comic book change a lot. You know, at my time, the comic book was much simpler. Right. And you open the book, and you will see immediately who did it. You know, you, you will see the style of Joe Cuba, the style of Carmine Infantino, the style of all those guys. Mm -hmm. Today, for me, it's my opinion, personal opinion. Photoshop makes everything look alike. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I personally, I don't like it. But you're right, Superman changed a lot. So just as a, as a follow-up, <clears throat> um, when you look at the, you know, the way comic books have, have gone, right, and, and how things have, have changed over, you know, over the years, um, Superman has always been the, the flagship of DC, right? I mean... Of superheroes. Of superheroes. Of superheroes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. And, um, and if you look at, I mean, if you go back to the... And I've always been, I've, I've always had an opinion that the comic book industry, for whatever reason, and I get it, it's a business, you know, but they tend to, you know, oversaturate the, the marketplace once some character is hot. Yeah. 
yeah. right? Something is hot. Well, well, well we got to have another comic, you know. I mean, Punisher is an example of that. They had one comic that was so hot, then they came out with 10 other, you know, different titles, and all of a sudden, nobody's buying Punisher anymore, right? right. And they tend to do that. But Superman, you know, when you go back, and you know, many of the people here are, you know, probably too young to, you know, to remember. But whippersnappers. They, yeah, <laughs> you know, they had, you know, you had the flagship title with Superman. Then you had Superman, uh, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, and yeah. Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane. You had Action Comics. Starring Superman. Starring Superman, <laughs> right? So you had all these these comics. So, so uh, today in in DC, and I'm sure Batman is probably the most popular comic right now. I think in sales it, it is for DC. And yeah. I'm, I think overall, is Superman still considered the flagship of, of DC? Yeah. By, it, by whom? By, uh, I, by the well, company. By DC? By, DC. The, by the DC company. Yeah. I, I, I would say for sales, it's considered Batman. But everybody that I've worked with has this desire to have Superman succeed um, but it's it's just really like uh, there was a really I forgot who said it but to write a good Superman story you have to be smarter than Superman like it's a really hard character to write it's a really hard story to like come up with something that's going to be innovative and new and frankly he's not a character that really relates that well with like the newer generations I mean He's a journalist. Like, who buys newspapers? Like, just in, just on that level alone. Um, but everybody wants him to succeed. Everybody knows that every kid, before they know who Superman is, before they know who Spider-Man is, before they know who Batman is, they put on a towel and they pretend to fly. And that is the basis of like everything we love in superheroes and comics, in the industry in general. And that's that's why everybody at DC really does want Superman to to have that have that continue to make that footprint in history going forward. So I don't know if I answered. But, but yeah. excuse me, but, yeah. excuse me. But today, everybody flies. Spider Man. <laughs> I don't. I only have everybody control over one at a time. Batman flying before. Now he flies. You know, whatever. It is, you know. <laughs> And, and, and you know, and uh, that, that's true about the kids wearing the cape to look like yeah. like Superman. Yeah, yeah. I was a yeah. kid. I used to in my bedroom at, at in, in New York. <laughs> I shared a bedroom with my brother. Yeah. What my bed was on this side, my brother's bed was on this side. And I used to jump back, <laughs> and, <laughs> back and, forth. and forth. My older brother has this, uh, my favorite picture. Of my older brother when he was like five, he had two black eyes <laughs> from jumping back and forth, and he went too far and he hit the brick wall. And, yeah. <laughs> for for me, it was. Tying a, a, a towel around my neck and and jumping off the neighbor's carport. <laughs> I, I was a garage jumper. Yeah, garage jumping. Right. Garage jumping. I, I did try to zip line down a down a telephone wire and, and broke the belt. <laughs> long it was a short drop. You actually mentioned something I wanted to ask you guys about. Um, you actually mentioned it, it's it's Superman's a hard character for people today to relate to. And this is a, an argument that you always hear comic book fans, especially Marvel fans, um, they'll say, well, Superman's too powerful. You can't relate to him. And the common argument that I personally adhere to is that Marvel makes characters that you're supposed to relate to. Like the Peter Parker, you're supposed to relate to Peter Parker. Superman's not a character you're supposed to relate to. He's someone you're supposed to strive to be. He's this. He's this sure, mythic but, figure. But that's that's well, also like a hard story. Oh, it's a terribly yeah, hard I mean, story, and that's what I was going to ask. With that totally different spin, do one do you adhere to that same mentality, and how do you approach re, you know, writing there's your own a, myths? Basically, there's a a tension inherent in the Superman concept uh, that divides people who write or or draw him. Uh, and uh, it, it basically comes down to two schools of thought. Um, and one of those schools of thought, in my opinion, is far easier to write for than the other. But there are, there, there are um, people who like to look at Superman as uh, an alien, uh, a Kryptonian first, uh, who runs around in human drag as Clark Kent. Uh, and Clark is sort of like uh, a Kryptonian's parody of what a human being is. Um, 
uh, and and so it's Superman. The alien is the is is the prime characteristic, and and Clark is a disguise. Mm -hmm. And then there's a school of thought that says um, Clark is the man. He's and and Superman is the job. Uh, and and I think that that is actually a much easier scenario to write for because uh, yes, Superman comes from Krypton, but he's an immigrant to America like most of us, mm -hmm. or most of our parents or grandparents, uh, raised with. Uh, raised as a poor farm kid with the best of American values, the, be the, the, the highest American ideals in the form of his parents. Um, you know, uh, uh, and um, he has to work for a living, which is why Clark is a reporter. Uh, um, but like, my take on my take on Superman, and this is why it's always easy to write for him for me, is that he is like anybody, any of us, who uh, uh, I think all of us have an impulse to do the right thing and to try and make the world a little bit better. You know, your average dad or mom, uh, they're out there to make a living, to provide for their kids, to make sure their family is safe and, and, and uh, well taken care of, and with whatever uh, extra resources they have, maybe make their community a little bit better. Whoever we are, we try to uh, uh, take care of and protect the people we love and try and make the world a little bit better. And that's just what people do. You know, not all of us are billionaires who can afford to spend our lives indulging in some uh, orphan revenge fantasy. Uh, <laughs> so, some of us have to work for a living, <laughs> and some of us some of us take care of people we we love because that's what people do. Mm -hmm. And I don't uh, I I and so I like the idea that that Clark is the man and Superman is the job, because it makes the motivation, giving Superman motivation, very easy. Mm -hmm. He's just doing what you would do. And he's doing it for the same reason you would do it. Mm -hmm. Because you just, because that's what people do. You do the, you do try and do the right thing. Right. And, and, uh, and as far as giving him challenges, he's by no means the most powerful hero out there anymore. But he can see a lot and he can hear all the suffering around him. And he has a heart. And he has to make choices because he can't be everywhere at once. He can't save everybody. So he's constantly prioritizing and triaging all the stuff that's going on, on around him. And that's a constant source of conflict for, for Clark because he also needs to have a life. He needs to spend enough time at work to actually bring home a paycheck because he's not a billionaire. Uh, and, and he needs to spend his resources. Even in, though he could make diamonds. He That's could make diamonds. <laughs> but but he, doesn't spend his, he doesn't spend his time making himself right. rich because he's spending his time you know, saving the guy falling from the dirigible or, or whatever. Uh, you know, so, uh, so, so my, take, my take on Clark is that he is a busy guy. He's just an over, he's a modern overcommitted man. Uh, like so many of us, and that seems to be that seems, for me, for me personal anyway. That's the door into Clark. That's the way to write stories where yeah. Clark when, is. Clark is just an overstressed, overcommitted dude. Absolutely, absolutely, I totally agree with all of that. When Greg and I first sat down, yeah. When, when Greg and I first sat down to talk about story and who we wanted to write, and. It just boiled down to the conversation, are we writing for Superman, or are we writing for Clark, or are we writing for Kal-El? And we were like, well, it's Clark. He's definitely Clark. That's the way to go. Yeah, so. Uh, anybody else? Oh, we have a question over here. Oh, sorry. No. I'll get to you guys, I swear. Who's going to win this year, Superman or Batman? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right, going along that same idea about the whole, you know, writing for Superman and everything. Um, I will say I've read the volume. I was thinking of this. I was I read the volumes Earth One uh, uh, by J. Michael Straczynski. I think love that concept, especially Volume One and Volume Two, where he's the teenager. I laughed out loud when I heard the whole line when John Ken is giving him the talk and he goes, "Look, 
Man of Steel, Woman of Paper. You have to realize this. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, that's awesome. How uncomfortable that was. But you, know, you know the, the Larry Niven uh, uh, piece that that's from, yes? Man of Steel, Woman of Kleenex? No, no, we're... <laughs> oh, th uh, there is an essay that uh, science fiction writer Larry Niven mm -hmm. did back, what, in the 70s, I think? Oh, yeah, in mm -hmm. 70s, late 60s, something like that. About how... Um, Superman and Lois Lane. He, he basically never physically. Yeah. He basically get describes from a from a scientific point of view what might happen, you know. And he pay, and and this this legendary science fiction writer uh, mm -hmm. uh, paints a word picture of you know the back of Lois's spine being blown off <laughs> and the city of Metropolis being being. Uh, uh, punctured and permeated by microscopic sperm holes all over the city and <laughs> well um <laughs> so superman's a virgin I, I never wrote that one <laughs> um but uh, on my question i i was thinking at least this the the thing is is that people say again i'm right there with you about the whole bet like he's a billionaire and he goes around purchasing toys instead of like using most of his money to go help you know the poor people to help restructure to feed Gotham. people yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. but yet he's relatable. Um, but the thing is, they say, like, well, we need to see a, a Superman that fails, that can't save people, and how he has to deal with that moral dilemma, because that would be the Superman movie we want to see when it comes to film. And I'm thinking of a character similar to kind of Superman and that idea of, I was going to say this about the Doctor from Doctor Who, that mm -hmm. he's almost kind of like in that way, if he's saving people, he's an ideal, he's got this magic box and everything, but he's also a guy suffering from severe PTSD because of the time war, the way they did that with the new series. So is there something of like a major flaw that could be added to Superman that you guys would love to draw for and stuff like that, I, that I, could be added into that storyline? As, a, as a, a sincere Whovian, I'll, I'll jump right in and then... <laughs> so I don't mean to hog this, but but there there are I think a lot of parallels with uh, Doctor Who because they you know they both lost their home worlds etc. But um, also uh, you know Superman fails every day. You don't have to in, you don't have to invent a weakness for Superman. You don't have to invent a situation where he fails at because he can't be everywhere. So for every person he saves, there's there's sometimes hundreds of, of people that he's aware of that, that he makes the choice against saving because he, he, has, to go where, where, he has to go where it's hottest, where he, where he has to be. So, uh, or wherever Lois is. Yeah, or wherever <laughs> Lois is. Yeah, or yeah. Jimmy because, yeah. you know, that he, that stupid he made the watch. mistake of giving him that, that damn watch. watch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just wanted milk. Yeah. <laughs> See, and and kind of kind of to one side of this. I always is, imagine I always imagine Superman like bursting through the window. What? <laughs> <laughs> An annoyed Superman. I, I think the problem that people tend to have is they really don't follow Superman, and they think he's far more powerful than he actually is. I think they have it in their mind that he's the guy who can throw planets around. When we were working on the book, John, I, I know you'll probably remember this, is that we were trying to keep things with, when Superman was in, in doing his thing, we were trying to keep it as ground level as we possibly could. And uh, I was telling you this story yeah. about uh, what Mike Carlin kind of told us, and I don't know if you remember this, is, uh, he pointed out in the, uh, the first Superman movie, one with Chris Reeve, that there was a, a crystal clear moment that, that showed us roughly the kind of thing to keep in, in our back pocket. And it's the scene where Lois's car is under the dirt and he lifts the car out and he pulls that, door, that car door off. Now, if you watch that scene, Chris Reeve plays it perfect. He doesn't act like it's a big deal. He doesn't act like he's, you know, really working at it or anything like that. He just grabs the door and he tears it off. And he said, people can understand that. They can understand, they can't maybe understand pushing over a building, but they can understand that there may be times that they want to tear a car door off. And that is a relatable thing. 
So the kind of power level that you're, you're thinking about is, is probably the thing that, that most people have, uh, use or is, is the impediment to kind of relating to Superman. To me, Superman was always very simple and relatable to because I grew up from prairie farm stock and you, as John says, generally people want to do the right thing and when you come, up, come from that, you help your neighbor. That's what Superman was to me. He was your neighbor. He wasn't there to save you or to protect you. He was there to help. Yeah, I think, I think the stories that, that when they focus on Superman as an alien or Superman as an outsider, um, I think we, we've touched a little bit about the, uh, that in, our last, in this last story arc. And the way that we do it is not more, more of, it's not a criticism, criticism of Superman or, or making him anything other than who he already is but rather how our, our media and our perceptions are led astray by, 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 by you know, the internet or the, you know, trolls, <laughs> bleeding cool. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but more so of, of like, the, you know, like, like Trump, you know, like the, like the, the bandwagon is moving forward and, 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 and people get caught up in that idea and they don't, they don't take the time to learn who he is. Also, you have to, like, it's, especially in our reincarnation of him, it's not really the same. Um, he's supposed to be only five years into the world. Like, he's not, he hasn't been around mm -hmm. for a long time and he doesn't have the reputation. Mm -hmm. um, but he's at the start there's, of his career. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a con continuous problem whenever you're dealing with superheroes or larger-than-life uh, mythic characters uh, that uh, um, sometimes called creeping powers syndrome, and uh, Superman has suffered from that, but he's certainly not the only one. But and I mean, his career has been long enough that he's we he's yeah. had to been from pe periodically you have to you have, you have to, to dial it back. You have to dial it back like L Jose Delbo's boobs. You have to just sort of <laughs> just, just ratchet it in a little bit. Uh, um, and uh, so part of that is just acknowledging that um, Superman is not the most powerful character in the DC universe by any stretch of, imagi uh, of the imagination. And I think that uh, um, if, you, if, you keep his, if you keep his powers, the traditional classic Superman powers, there's more than enough ways to give him opponents and difficulties. Well, when my case on Superman, I went to, when I did, I was doing Superboy. I think I did all the characters from, uh, from DC Comics, from Superboy. I saw Superboy growing into Superman, you know. Uh, and also I did Jimmy Olsen and uh, all the characters, also Supergirl. That means I'm very familiar with all the characters of, of, of Superman. But uh, I think the guy is, is unique. Everything that is, this gentleman I'm talking about, the character, I think is really true. And for me, it's very important that Superman stay being Superman, you know, because they created a bunch of new characters who overpower to make it better than Superman. I don't think they will change that thing. You know, Superman will be forever. Going off what you said, you talked about failure for Superman and what he could do, but we have had some versions of that. I mean, have you guys ever read Injustice, Gods Among Us? Sure, but I mean, I can't keep track of all the various different continuities and yeah. which Superman in which reality. And which, I mean, there are, since Convergence now, there are 62 universes, all of which have their own continuity. I can't keep track of the it's, continuity of one universe. It's the one where Superman Luke accidentally <laughs> kills Lois and blows up Metropolis. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm roughly familiar with it. It comes from the, from the video game. But Superman would make an awesome dictator. I hate to admit it, but he did a hell of a job doing that. <laughs> Dictator, but okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> the, the, the very, I, I like the fact that you think there can be such a thing as an, an awesome right, dictator. Right. That's not what I, I'm, what I meant is that 
it's the basically that version. What I like about it is it shows us what History Superman teachers. could do <laughs> if he want. It shows that Superman could very easily rule the world if he wanted to. And he well, does it to end all war, all famine. Yeah, we've played with that that kind of story before in in the past yeah. as, as various dream scenarios yeah, or, there's, there's the, or alternate universes and. The one where he, where he, where Superman makes a like a robot army of himself. Yeah, and he's he's like afraid this, of this invasion. is not a yeah it's, no but that was a great story I yeah mean, I, I know the name of it. but it it's a concept that's been we that has been played with over and over and over and uh, it it tends to kind of play off the idea of Superman as the most powerful guy in the universe and he ain't and he ain't also also anytime you you write a story like that you have to. Uh, somehow sidestep one of the core characteristics of Superman, right. because I think I think one of the themes that's developing among all four of us here is that uh, Superman isn't a certain set of powers or a certain level of power or or a certain costume. Uh, um, so he can wear t -sh a t-shirt and jeans and still be Superman. He can he can uh, uh, be without powers and still be a care uh, still be a man of character that is of super level. It's not the powers; it's the heart. Right. Basically. In other words, he wouldn't take over the world. He wouldn't be a dictator. Okay. So you so in order to do a story where Superman becomes a dictator, you have to uh, you have to find some way to explain why he would do that. You either write him as a different character, in which case he's not really Superman, or you have to create some sort of rationale that, that justifies what you want to do with the plot. It's not necessarily an easy fit to do. Yeah. yeah. Dream sequences okay, are Okay, so first easy. I have to defend Red Batman. Red Kryptonite. Because everybody's been talking bad about Batman. <laughs> So, yeah, he's more than just an orphan. That man and, sucks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one who said Yeah, but I understand what you're saying with the Superman books, that so far as the younger generation, at least for me, my favorite Superman stories are where he's either evil or the B word, just because there's children in the back. Um, with Injustice, there's Red Sun, Earth One, he's pretty badass there. And all of that. So, and now with Man of Steel, they're giving him more attitude back. Where Batman is talking to him, and he just turns away, doesn't even let him finish the conversation. So, my question to the panel would be: Where do you see his character going in like 20 years from now? Since Wonder Woman, you're saying, and everything, Batman, and all of that, they're going. Everybody's going dark. Even Marvel is having that trouble too where they're going darker too. Do you see us going back to more campy or classic? Or do I you wish see it's going it, even I wish that was the case. Yeah. If if it if we're it's so ever, much funner to tell those stories that are campy and fun and, and energetic. And, light. and yeah. yeah, if if the if if the uh, if the direction that everything is headed is just ever darker. And I, I, I'm not I don't, sure I, I want to live it there. Is. I really don't think it is because like if you just look at the history of like of of the. So we we did Super Doom. And where Superman is infected by a doomsday virus and he's turning into doomsday, and it's dark, and and um, sales were good, you know, everybody, people were happy with it, but uh, you look at the most popular book, uh, action book that that we made last year, it was Bizarro, and it was on Bizarro World, and there was the Cheese Moon and Square People, and it was fun, and and it's one of the, I had so much fun drawing that issue. One of the best-selling issues uh, of my entire run on Man of Steel was where the two Mixes Pitalik stories. You know, the first yeah. one, which uh, uh, basically was that one Lobo. giant fart joke. <laughs> you know, uh, so um, uh, and I would be quick to point out that you can't be doing fart joke Superman stories uh, as a rule, but. To occasionally be able to do a Bizarro story or a Mixius Pitalik story or something with, with uh, uh, a, a lighter take on it uh, is really sort of a necessary leavening, especially in an era of dark comics. And they usually do really well. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and they're really fun to do. I just wanted to follow up on what he actually was saying. Um, 
Batman uh, just a sucks. comment and a question. <laughs> um, I kind of disagree a little with what you're saying. Uh, the whole I don't understand the relatable part of uh, having to relate to Superman. It's fantasy at the end of the day. We don't have to relate to everything. Sure. You know, there's crisis in the world, and we get up in the morning and read papers of death and destruction, and have to go to work or our sucky jobs, right? And then right. come back home and you know deal with the family, and then you know who don't you want two hours of just you know, awesome fantasy. Lying right? around, <laughs> saving yeah. the day. Absolutely, you know. I agree more with the, the older uh, part of the guys on the sure. panel who are the creators. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, with the follow-up, uh, you know, David Ayers, who's doing Suicide Squad, just made a comment last week and said that um, he's always been excited to do a super villain movie and because uh, he finds superheroes boring and, and, uh, and, and heroes are just boring we don't like good guys anymore and right. uh you know to follow up on the darker edge of things you know um i don't relate to darth vader but i love star wars i can't relate right. to anything that darth vader does nothing you know or or gandalf you know it's like <laughs> but we love lord of the rings you know why is there this especially with the newer generation why is this um i guess this uh concept of having to relate to superman you know i really quickly um i believe he is the most powerful being in the dc universe and there's a scene in um Superman Returns, which I, I like more than Man of Steel, where he shoots up into the air and he's in space and he is listening to everyone's, you know, all the, the stuff that's going on in the planet. And I think in that moment, when you see that scene, it, it really explains everything about who Superman is. Yeah. He can't be everywhere all the time and he has to deal with that on a daily basis. I, I think his greatest superpower is that he is the, the most powerful being in the universe and he can wipe out the universe if he really wanted to. And his greatest power is not doing that. So, I think um, on the on the uh, on the level of uh, you know Superman is hearing everything and and knowing everything that that's that's the trauma that's the daily trauma that he goes through. I think that's that's a gorgeous story that I don't think has been exploited enough. I I, I, I know we haven't dealt with it much, but that idea of I mean that's it. And, and um, man, I, I, if I were Superman and I had that ability, I'd be just bawling every day. <laughs> Curled up on my bathroom just, floor. Just on the puppies I couldn't yeah. save. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get overwhelmed with just all the stuff I have to do as a regular human dude. Can you imagine yeah. Superman's daily to-do list? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. That can, well, sure. like, that can be a story. That is a story. Well, it, it's also it's also just sort of uh, you know you can actually you could build a story around that, but it's also sort of just a uh, an an angle from which to approach Superman when you're telling a Superman story. One of the ways you can think about him is oh he's a man with way too much to do, he's a man with too much on his plate, and 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 uh, this was actually coined for me by, by Wheezy and it informed yeah. the way I would tell a Superman story and the way I would set up uh, scenes, you know, like, like you know, my Daily Planet City Room is a really busy, bustling place. Uh, my, I have Superman fly closer to street level a lot because I want to see, see that there's, you know, I don't want just the nice, neat, Wayne Boring skyline in the background. I want to see uh, trestles and overpasses and people and windows and cars and stuff going, so that, the, so that I'm always trying to convince, uh, uh, convey a sense that, that, man, Superman is up to here with stuff to do all the time. Yeah. That his yeah. world is crowded with stuff to do, and he can't do it all. And and so it's it doesn't necessarily become a story point so much as it becomes uh, um, one of the uh, backdrop, one of the avenues by which uh, that I keep in mind as a way to characterize Superman and how to depict his world to convey that, just chronically. Yeah, yeah, we, absolutely. I we mean, have, I, it, it, with the relatability in particular, like he doesn't need to be relatable. Like we, when we when we took away his powers and we put him in a t-shirt, that wasn't about making him more relatable to people. That was about putting him in a situation where, that he hadn't been in, in, in a, well, I mean, he's 76 years old, he's, he's, he's been in every situation before, but in recent history, he hasn't had to answer that question of, with nothing, everything to lose, nothing to gain, would he still stand up for the little guy? And yeah, yeah, he would. I mean, of course. 
We have time for one more question, so no pressure. <laughs> Make it good. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a simpler question. Since you were talking about the stewardship of the character and what he represents, I would ask, what is your favorite personal Superman story? Now, it doesn't have to be the one that you've worked on or, or anything else. I'm just wondering what encapsulates or shows the character it, at his best? Because for me personally, I believe it was all-star Superman. With that particular series, it gave us the idea of both uh, pre- and post-crisis Superman and him having a limited time to do all the things that he needs to do um, and show that he is the paragon that he is. So, please, which stories would you decide to, uh, would encapsulate that? Hmm. I, I, I did really enjoy uh, All-Star Superman, but not actually for the, the, the characterization of Superman, but rather for the, the, the way that they told the story in, in that almost like every issue is a one-shot, like uh, evolving Herculean uh, uh, trials. Right. Um, that's a really tough question. That is. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 I'm trying to. There's like elements that you head. could take from each, but it's I'm like going you know. Through my mental Rolodex right now and coming up dry. How many how many Superman stories have there been in 76 years? <laughs> exactly. You know, particularly when you take into account every radio play, every Fleischer movie. cartoon, every yeah. movie, every episode Television of the episode. TV show. I mean, how many how many stories have have there there been? It's it's really hard to pick from something like that. Yeah. What, what do you think? Do you have a favorite Superman story? No. <laughs> no. There's your answer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There are, yeah, they're either. I think, I think Superman as a character, um, for me, works best in animation form. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but You're putting all of you out of a job by saying that. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. no, no. They're, it's they're, always well, a challenge. This is, what's, this is what's called a personal opinion, and that's kind of allowed. I think Batman works better in comic book form than in, in TV Film. form. Or, you know, yeah. um, because you can play with the... the, the it, it's just a visual thing. You, you can see him kind of levitate, and then the cape wavers, and, the, and then whoosh. And great artists can capture that in a panel, but I think it really... It, it's just a, it, it's a lovely thing in the anime, especially Max, my, uh, the Max Flusher years. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think like, Mechanical yeah. Monsters might be the best Superman story ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. Um, but but it's you know. Or what's the one with Lois Lane and the Tommy Gun? Uh, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lois is so hot in that. <laughs> Picks up the Tommy Gun. <laughs> Starts blasting away. Yeah, yeah. I used to love to draw Lois for some reason wearing a bomber jacket and jod purse. I don't know why right, right, in the right. 90s she's yeah, going around in a had a thing bomber jacket that. and a bomber because and, and it's from that. It's from that scene where she where she Where's picks it? up the Tommy gun and it's like <laughs> rah, 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 rah. <laughs> badass Lois. I love badass yeah, Lois. Yeah, for sure. With her Elizabeth shoe hair though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, your question would be a lot easier to answer if we were picking our top five. Uh, but but uh, Superman stories, you can say that Superman is, a, is, is a part of our mythology. He's a mythological character. And, and, that, and the very essence of myth is that they are stories that are told and retold and retold. And, uh, you know, people complain, well, how can you come up with something new for Superman, blah, blah, blah. No, you're just telling, you're telling the same stories, essentially, for a new generation. Uh, because there are, there are certain stories, certain storylines, and certain situations that are intrinsic to the Superman myth. And, and they, they have, uh, you know, every generation is going to take their shot at the classic motifs. Um, and so to... It'd be hard for me to pick any any particular one Superman story. I like Mechanical Monsters. Of the stuff I've done, I think maybe the uh, the the Superman and the Holocaust uh, issues in eighty eighty one and eighty two, where where I tried to draw like Joe Schuster and and um, you know there's the uh, there's the one where. Uh, up, up until that point, Superman has been a man of mystery, just zooming in, getting the job done, and zooming out. 
and uh, uh, avoiding, being, avoiding Lois because he doesn't want to give interviews. He just wants to get the job done and move on. But, um, but he's gaining notoriety anyway, and he, he becomes the symbol of uh, the American Nazis uh, party who was, who was sort of rising to prominence in 1938. And uh, so Superman crashes the Nazi rally and, uh, and uh, you know, reads them the riot act and smashes the swastika and all that. That's, that's and so that, that... Versus Nazis is always a... Like versus a, Nazis? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anytime, anytime Superman can punch Nazis, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's, that might be my favorite. I also... Uh, um, I also like the Mixius Pitalik story and the Bizarro story and yeah, <laughs> that stuff yeah. too. Uh, yeah. how, um, refining his question, uh, what is each of your favorite Superman story that you have participated what with? What about me? <laughs> okay, of, of all the Superman work you've done, yes. do you have any that is your particular favorite of the Superman work you've done? Well, no. I have to choose it's complicated because I did Superman also for the comic book World Finance with okay. Batman. So that would that include that? Yeah, yeah, I think that World Finance, uh, I yeah. like it much better than that because I have more opportunity to draw many, many different things and I was not restricted by the panel, the panel shape. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. And besides, I was lucky to have a tremendous ink. Nice. Was it well, Joe Giella on that? Who? Who, who inked you on that one, Joe Giella? Oh, you know, now I open my mouth to fun because I forgot <laughs> his name. No, was a, uh, was a great guy uh, from Philippines. Uh, but, oh, 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 oh. Uh, do you remember any of the guy? You know, I don't. You don't. No. I'll th I'll think of it when we're downstairs somewhere, and I'll, <laughs> I'll scream it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Philippines. <laughs> Alfredo. Alfredo Alcala. Alfredo Alcala. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Alfredo Alcala. He was. He did a tremendous work in my pencils. He was engraving, actually. You know, it was, yes. yeah. line, you know, it was beautiful. Incredible, incredible ink. Yeah. I enjoy doing the the comic book, and also I enjoy seeing the final art because that, the guy did an incredible thing. And you know that eternal fight between who is better, Superman or Batman? Yeah. 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 Superman. And. and uh, <laughs> One thing they try to do now, today, you know, in the, in the old days, they try to do Batman, you know, a guy better than Superman, but they're two different characters. Batman yeah. is more a detective than a superhero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, then they make a fly now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't fly before. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, that, that's what enjoy Superman was yeah. doing the world finest. Yeah. Yeah. Superman and Batman are sort of the yin and yang over at DC. Yeah. 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 Uh, what are your personal favorites of the Superman stuff you've done? Mm. Uh, personal favorite was, uh, I think, uh, the death, the funeral, the return storyline, mm -hmm. just because it uh, was a... Well, I mean, the entire time we were working on Superman, it was the gigantic collaborative uh, chaos and uh, happy chaos. Happy chaos. Yeah. I I just I don't know and that I just one. Lo I just loved that environment. And <laughs> the, the, character from the, the greatest <laughs> thing that that came out of that was that particular storyline. And I think yeah. uh, I, I feel a tremendous amount of pride at how. How how well it stands up? Yeah, it's okay. it's stood up pretty well over the intervening years, and I think I that's mean, the true oh, it's, test. it's a looming shadow. Yeah, it's yeah. A for, looming for shadow. us now. <laughs> so, and um, I'm sometimes amazed that 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 given uh, the the size of the thing and all the nonsense that was going on around it, because you know this, uh, people seem to think this was a planned thing. Oh, no, I know. And when it absolutely was, it was impossible to plan. We figured we were and just telling a internet. story. Just telling it a was story. Pre, it was pre-internet. We were telling a story that we knew, and our audience, we felt, was simply the comics audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the rest of the world that went insane. They went berserk. They went yeah. berserk. Yeah. And we couldn't, 
we couldn't believe it. We couldn't, like, what? So is there, uh, is there any particular, though, bit that you drew that uh, um, is, like one, of my, like, one of my favorite moments is in, in Funeral for a Friend where Wheezy wrote this scene where Ma and Pa Kent have to watch uh, Superman's funeral on television, and it's the funeral of their child, yeah. and they can't tell anybody. Yeah, that was heartbreak. I remember you know, those panels. Yeah, that's yeah. so. And it, it, I mean, that was so hard. I sometimes choke up when I just describe yeah. it. Is there any scene or or particular story from your run that it, it, it really basically the mirror image of that scene? There is a scene uh, where Ma and Pa can't are watching. Uh, the television and and the word has come that that Superman is dead and it's just it's three panels which are emblazoned in my burnt into my subconscious three panels repeating panels of just you can see them over the television looking at the television towards the reader and and the news is going on they say nothing on the page uh -huh. it's all just the stuff and on the bottom of the page is a tall, thin panel where they're just hugging each other. Yeah. And yeah. I was choking up drawing the silly thing. And <laughs> it, that it's was just a up. freaking comic book. So, no, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> it's just a comic. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, what about you? Do you have a, do you have a, a favorite Superman story that you've worked well, on? Or, way, or even just a favorite less, scene? It's, it's so much shallower. Like, like it's not, it didn't make me cry. Um, uh, well, the, 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 the Parasite issue, there was a Villains Month book that I did that was the first time I got to write and draw a book in just me. First time I worked with my colorist, Tabeo More, who is just beautiful. Um, that was like just like kicking down the doors every day. Every, every room I walked into that day, I was like, bathroom, boom, kitchen, <laughs> boom, I am here, this is awesome. <laughs> Do you remember the, the issue or the issue number? No, well, it's it's the parasite issue of the villains month. I think it's like Superman twenty four point five. There's like a decimal point in it, so oh, I for never. God's sake. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, well, they did it. They did it every 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 week. They did a, a new Superman book. Right. Yeah, crossed right. out the name right. and then yeah. put a villains month put over. Villains it. Month. Um, okay, that and uh, we had we had Superman grow a beard at one point. <laughs> and uh, in the Bizarro issue, we, we were, I was, we, the issue was written, and I'm, I'm trying to be fast, I know you guys gotta, um, issue was written, there was no room for it, but my editor, Eddie, my editor, calls me up and is like, we gotta get rid of the beard in this issue. And we're, we're like, Greg and I have been talking about this long scene of like him looking in a mirror, and he's, he's like losing his powers, and he's like, trying to shave it off and, and all this stuff and just this very serene moment and I'm like, it's a bizarro issue. We don't have that, that, that downbeat in there. So in the issue, in, in parallel to the super doomed stuff, bizarro gets infected by the doomsday virus also, but instead of becoming like an agent of death, he becomes an agent of like silly like pixies and like he's Unicorns. yeah you know and, and like he has like giant puppies coming out of his arms and um and so he has like i'm like all right so superman's has a weakness to magic so i have a, a pixie just come up and rip his beard off like it's a like a stage prop <laughs> That was, that, was, that was one of my favorite That's problem solving brilliant. moments. Inventive comic, comic book storytelling solutions. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Everybody, Superman family, Thanks, guys. Please thank Jose, John, Tom, and Aaron.